All right, well, here is our rhetoric lecture and writing lecture for this week. And once again, I will try to keep it to 15 minutes, uh, 10 for the others. And this one's just a little longer. It's, it's a rhetoric class, so I tend to spend a little more time on the rhetoric and writing section each week. But I hope you can watch this. Um, this is for uh, week eight, so we're about halfway through the semester, as I mentioned in other videos, if you watch those first. And um, we're going to talk today about two important things, unity and coherence. And we're also, I'm going to mention the peer response. I'm having a little trouble with that, so I'll say something about that in just a minute. And then also we'll talk about punctuation and the importance of what I call punctuation actually matters. It's important because it can cause miscommunication. If you want to find more information on what I'm talking about today, you can go to pages 20 to 24 in our Harbrace, H-E, Harbrace Essentials. That's the main textbook for the class. And um, it's in section 3D, but if you, if, uh, or just pages 20 to 24. We're going to talk about how you can organize your ideas, how you can use pronouns, repetition, and transitions as ways of making your writing clearer. And, and when we talk about unity, we're it, basically it's all about one thing. Things are focused. When we talk about coherence, uh, we're talking about being understood, easily understood or understandable. So one way to make your writing a little easier to follow, easy to understand, is to use a pattern of organization. And one of the most common patterns of organization is what's called chronological order. Chronological order is just another a big word for time. Uh, chrono, chronos is, I think, maybe the god of time or something from Greek mythology, if I remember right. Um, so chronological just basically is this idea that you're arranging your ideas. This happened first then this happened, next this happened, and finally something else happened. Now you don't have to use those exact same words as this paragraph does, but you can see this is the process of getting a television show into production. So a lot of times we use chronological order to do one of two things. One, like this paragraph, would be to explain a process. You want to give somebody instructions. 90% of YouTube videos, it seems like if you look online, are instructional videos. You know. Um, I was having trouble with my garage door the other day, and before I called somebody to come out and repair it, I got on YouTube, and in about five minutes, I had it fixed. And they did a very nice step-by-step. -step. First check this, then check this, finally do this. I did those things, and I fixed it. So that was a good process, and, and they used chronological order. If they hadn't used chronological order, I would have done this first, and that would have been the wrong thing to do first. So again, process analysis is a good time to use chronological order, and you can probably guess if you haven't already, the other good time is when you're telling a story. And it doesn't have to be a children's story, like a bedtime story or something, but anytime you're relating in, in rhetoric, sometimes we call it a series of events. These things happen. If you read a police report, it's not like a, it's not like a bedtime story, right, for kids, but it does have a series of events that are related in chronological order. So a really great thing to do if you're trying to tell a story or if you're trying to um, explain how something works or how something happens is to use um, chronological order to organize your paragraphs. You're going to do that with a topic sentence, like in any other paragraph where you state your main idea, either the process you're explaining, like how to get a television show into production, or the story you're telling about what happened last summer, and then you're going to use transitional expressions. And when you're doing chronological order, they don't, they're not necessarily always first, then next, finally. They might be, but they're just uh, words that signal time order. It could be after that. There's, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of transitions you could probably use. So that's one way, one pattern of organization. We have three that I want to mention today. The other one that I wanted to talk about next is called spatial order. Um, chronological order will be good when you're telling a story. Spatial order is good when you're describing something. So if you're asked, maybe it's not even an English class. Maybe you're in a psychology class and or... Uh, early childhood education class and the instructor says, describe how the child acted, you know, during the test. And you would probably observe them and then you would probably give sort of a physical description of their movements, their actions, so on and so forth, how they were sitting, what they look like. And you might do that by using words, not first, second, third, fourth, but things like uh, on the right, the child was, you know, sitting and then on the left, there was another child and in front of them, you're using these words that are transitions, but they're transitions of spatial order. This is a is a is a more of a physical description of a place. This paragraph, if you want to pause and take a look at this, you'll see it's describing topic sentence underlined here. When the city presses in on me, I return in my mind to my hometown in St. Mary, Jamaica. So this is describing this beautiful spot in Jamaica 
that this person goes home to in their mind, they imagine it and it calms them down. Uh, up in a mango tree, through the lush vegetation, down at the coconut, they look down at the coconut growth, beyond is a wide valley, farther out the ocean, the sea, and I go back and I'm just sitting on my special branch. They've made a full circle and all this is using uh, spatial order. We're gonna look at a couple of examples of how this might look in a more academic college type um, paper that you might be writing for another class in just a moment. The last one is what's called emphatic order. Be aware too that I'm just sharing three ways that you can organize. You can always blend these. You can also use other ways. These are just three that are, are very commonly used and, and useful, I think. So emphatic order, just like it sounds, emphasis, you know, making an emphasis on something. You're emphasizing one thing over another, and then that makes it clearer to the reader what you're trying to say. So in this one, you see uh, Oscar Michaud was the most successful and influential African-American filmmaker in the first half of the 20th century. And it talks about him growing up and then it says more notably. So this is an important point that they want to highlight. So they use a transition. And then they say above all, even more important down here. You could say most important, least important, also important. There's different ways you can do this, but as long as you're showing what you want to emphasize as the writer and what you want your reader to understand that you're that you're highlighting or making more important. And again, you would you would arrange these, you know, as long as there's a logical order, maybe you start with the very least important thing and move on to the most important thing or, or vice versa, like this one. I th actually, I think this one starts with, a, it's important, but this one's more important at the end. Um, however you do that, sometimes we call this order of importance, but it's the same thing. You're just organizing your paper based on what you think is important and what you wanna emphasize uh, in, in some kind of an order that way. So those are three ways that you can potentially organize up. Oh, I said three, but I, I lied. There are four that I, I forgot that I added this one in the other day. Um, logical order is another way. And this one, uh, basically you can see the purple and blue highlights on the left side there. We move from a uh, specific to a general idea or a general to a specific idea. So here we have, it's talking about different kinds of reading. When one reads for work or for pleasure, comprehension is the goal. And so it's talking about reading comprehension and it starts out with readers. These are just everybody who reads, right? But we get all the way down to uh, adult literacy learners, which are people who are struggling to learn to read. But in between that, we have strong readers or what are called proficient readers, less strong or less proficient. And then finally people struggling to learn to read. So this is arranged from general, the average reader to very specific, right? Uh, adult literacy learners. And again, that's just a, if you, if you didn't organize this clearly, like if you had the less proficient before the more proficient or the adult literacy before the readers, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make as much sense. Or again, we use that word coherence earlier. Um, coherence is just being able to understand something. So um, if you arrange it this way, it makes it more understandable, more coherent for your reader. You could flip it and do it the exact opposite. As long as there's some kind of an order, that is easy for your reader to follow. So you could have adult literacy learners, then less proficient, then proficient, and then just general readers. And that would just be flipping the order. So that is the last one. Those are four. Okay. So now let's take a second. And if you'd like to, uh, it'd be great while we're doing this. If we were in class, I would give you a minute or two to read through this and then decide at the bottom what pattern of organization might work best if you were uh, observing a preschool classroom, maybe you're in an early childhood class um, and you're in this preschool classroom and you're asked to write a paragraph describing one of the students. So here you've observed the student and now you're going to come back and you're going to write this paper describing them in their natural habitat. <laughs> Children's habitat is preschool, right? Uh, environment. I think we'd say environment. I think habitat would be more for like giraffes or something. But um, after observing in a preschool classroom, you're asked to write a paragraph describing one of the students. And so um, do you use chronological order, time order? First this happened, then this happened. Do you use spatial order? Um, on the left, there was a bookshelf and the children were sitting in the middle on the rug and et cetera, et cetera. Do you use emphatic order, emphasizing one thing over another or logical order going from general to specific? So what would work best? So again, if you wanted to just pause it and then come back, you can do that. And um, let me, before we go. And so if you did pause it and you came back, I would say probably in this case, it might be best to use spatial order because um, the instructor, the professor, uh, asked you to write a description. Description is often, doesn't have to be physical because it could have other things, but I think if you're describing a child in the classroom, you might wanna at least talk about, you know, 
again, their environment, what's around them, uh, what kind of things are they doing? Are they moving? Are they sitting? Are they, you know, and so you might end up using transitions like, um, you know, at the, big, at the front of the classroom, the teacher's um, doing an activity and some of the children are on the rug, this child was in the back because they're in trouble or no, I don't know, whatever it might be, right? But I think spatial order might be the best bet for this one. Okay, let's keep going. And again, like I said, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because I want to keep these videos short as, pos as short as possible. But if you wanted to pause it and just think about it for a minute, that'd be a really effective way to make sure you're getting this. And these will come up eventually on a quiz, I promise. Um, probably the next quiz. So these are good to be aware of. And, I, and I'm putting on the quiz because I think they're so important. Just being able to have these patterns of organization, so to speak, in your hip pocket so you can use these anytime you need to, especially if you ever have to do a writing assignment where you're under pressure of time. Um, all right, your computer science professor asks you to explain the different security needs of a first, a general consumer. That's me. I'm, I'm not, a, I don't have any specific security needs. I don't think too much. Um, a small business owner who would have maybe some different security needs than I do, and a large corporation who definitely have different security needs. So what kind of, you're writing this paragraph for your computer science class, and your instructor, your professors asked you to look at these three different groups, the, the average person who uses a computer like all of us, most of us, the small business owner, and then a huge corporation, and what are their security needs? So would you use chronological order? First this happened, then this happened. Spatial order. On the left side, there was a computer. On the right side, there was a guy trying to steal my information. <laughs> Emphatic order. This is most important. This is next important. Or logical order, moving from general to specific. So again, if you want to pause this, and then I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on what I think would work best. And by the way, there's no right or wrong answer. This is not a math problem to solve. So you could probably make a case for almost any of these, although I think there's probably a couple that would work better. And, I'll, and so for, if you did pause and you came back, Give you a second there pause 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 <laughs> um i would say logical order might work really well with this because remember logical order is where we move from like a general to a specific idea so here we have our general user a little more specific a little more you know different kinds of needs we have the small business owner and finally the large corporation so if you use general to specific i think you could probably use emphatic order i don't really think spatial order is going to work here it's not a physical description but again, I think on this one, logical order would be a really good bet if you were doing this. All right, now you're writing a paragraph explaining how to take a patient's blood pressure. Um, and what would you do? Would you use chronological? Do this first, do that, then, then third, do this. Remember, chronological is just time order. Would you use spatial order on the left, on the right? Emphatic. Uh, this is most important. This is next important or logical, going from general to specific. So again, if you want to pause it, think about it, and then come back and I'll tell you um, what I think would work best. So usually when I share this example with students, I usually get chronological and spatial both, because like, well, you have to put the thing around their arm and you have to pump the little deal, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, and that's true, but I think generally chronological is a better choice. And the reason why I'll say is because it's a process, it's step by step. So imagine if you do have the spatial part right, but you put it in the wrong order, now, it's not like you're going to harm anyone, probably taking their blood pressure wrong, but some some medical procedures, you definitely want to do it in the right order. Like if you were taking someone's blood or something, because um, you could hard, hurt them. But so, but at any rate, probably chronological is better because it's a step-by-step -step process. If you do it in the wrong order, you might not get the correct reading of the blood pressure. So um, I would say chronological on this one. All right, last one for this. You are now in a history class, imagine, and your history professor asks you to write a paragraph that explains the most important actions that uh, Cesar Chavez took to bring attention to the plight of farm workers. So you might be familiar with Cesar Chavez, who, who did a lot of activism, um, especially around migrant workers um, in the 60s, 70s, and I think into the 80s, uh, maybe, maybe even beyond that. Um, I have to look that up. But you're going to be talking about what he did um, that was helpful, that uh, brought attention to the plight of many farm workers. So would you use chronological, spatial, emphatic, or logical? So again, if you want to take a moment and just pause. Da, 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 I need the Jeopardy music there. And okay, if you're back. So chronological could work because you could just say he did this in 1968, he did this in 1974, et cetera, et cetera. But I think for this one, probably emphatic order would work best because you're going to say probably something. If you go into Wikipedia and look him up, it might even be written this way in the, in the entry when you look at the things that he accomplished. It might show, um, you know, he did this, he did this, and most importantly, he did this or, you know, something like that. So I think emphatic order would work best. You want to decide, do you want to emphasize 
this thing that he did in 1973, or would you rather emphasize this other thing? Again, you could do chronological, but I think emphatic order would be really good when we're talking about somebody who had an impact on a whole, you know, uh, basically a whole country or, or beyond. A lot of times we'll do, you know, what was the most significant thing that they did? Just like you would see in a history book, right? The most important thing that George Washington did, you know, or whatever it might be, right? And so that's what I would recommend for this one is emphatic order. So those are those are really important ways that you can you can make your writing more coherent almost immediately just by imposing a little order. So if you're you know, and a lot of this you're doing already, so don't worry. It's not like you're not doing this. Um, lots of people do this either intuitively or they've learned it in other classes. Um, but if you're not doing that, when you're telling a story, just ask yourself, am I am I am I do I know what my order is? Because that's the big question. If you know, then you're probably doing something that makes it clear and coherent to your reader. But if you're kind of just putting transitions here and there, but you're not sure why, you might ask yourself, should this be chronological order, spatial order, emphatic order, logical order? And then what kind of transitions would I use if I'm writing that way? And the more you're conscious of it, the better um, and the clearer your writing will be. So that is a little bit about that. Just a couple more things. I'm going to go through this one really quickly. But again, if you want to stop and read these, you can. But just another thing you can do is you can use pronouns. And obviously, we all use pronouns. I just did. I said we and I. We don't want to repeat uh, the names of the same thing over and over and over. That becomes, um, you know, re too repetitious. But there are times when actually that repetition can be good. So sometimes like in this uh, paragraph, we've used the word both and we've used, um, you know, reference to these two different people. So again, if you look at this, this is just something to throw out there. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much right now, but um, in the interest of time, but using pronouns. Uh, instead of repeating a keyword, use pronouns um, such as there and they. Um, so obviously you don't want to just repeat the same. Like if you're, let's say you're writing an article uh, or, or a paper and you have a main character from a story. Um, instead of repeating that name, main character's name, you could say the protagonist, the main character, he, him, you know, as much as you can. Instead of, instead of just repeating that person's name over and over. It just gives a variety to your writing and it can also add clarity and it's just a little bit easier on the uh, reader. Another thing. This is kind of the opposite. We were just saying, don't repeat too much, use prepositions. But sometimes certain key phrases can be good to repeat if you're trying to emphasize something. If you look at this paragraph, this is a paragraph about the no child left behind. You probably heard of that legislation that came about during the second President Bush's um, tenure. And um, they've used different words here. Nickleby kids, no child left behind, NCLB, which is the acronym for no child left behind. And then they've just used the pronoun they down here several times. So again, sometimes, and this they becomes rep repetitive intentionally to make a point. And that's, that's okay. Sometimes um, using repetition to, to emphasize something can be good sometimes. Another thing we talked about transitions a little bit and just being aware of what is the relationship between two parts of your sentence. So this is what's um, kind of a compound sentence, a short one, but you have the athlete stretched, she studied him. And so that means we're just adding some additional information. He was stretching and she was studying. Um, the athlete shouted out, so, so this is cause and effect. So this transition, if we use it intentionally, it, it's part of our meaning, right? Because here it's uh, the first one, and is adding additional information. So is, is a cause and effect relationship. And this is also kind of cause and effect. The athlete frowned because she was making him nervous and then the athlete raced while this is happening at the same time um, so again just an idea when you're using conjunctions these words that connect or transitions just being aware of what the meaning is because that can change the meaning of your sentence depending on what transition or conjunction that you might use and then this is just a list this is on the, in the harbor race book on pages 23 to 24 these are uh, transitions listed by how you would use them. So if you're adding information, if you're giving alternatives, if you're comparing two things, if you're making a concession, which is something we're going to talk about more when we talk about argument writing, um, if you're contrasting, which is a lot like comparison, looking at the differences, this is looking at the similarities. If you're looking at place, when we talked about um, space order, uh, like words like across, next to, beyond, farther, nearby, these are all um, for description especially, but when you're talking about place, sequence, so that would go with chronological order and time is also a little bit like chronological order. So again, this is on page 23 to 24 in the Harbor's book. Um, if you're trying to add transitions just to kind of make your writing more clear, you might look at this, these pages in the book and see if any of these would help make your writing clearer. And that would be something that I would recommend probably not worrying about during the first draft, 
but worrying about a lot more during your second draft, or even if you had an assignment where you had a uh, beyond a second draft. Um, it's a great time when you're doing editing or proofreading to add in transitions and, and different things like that. Okay, last thing I'm really going to cover today is, is this section called Punctuation Matters. We may not do all these, but I want to show you a couple of them just to get the point across that um, punctuation actually can change the meaning. And so everything that I talk to you about in terms of rhetoric and writing is all about trying to be more clear in communication. That To me, that's the only reason we study grammar. Um, I mean, some people just study it because that's what they do. They're grammarians or linguists, but most people, we learn grammar so that we can express ourselves clearly. That's the only good reason that I can think of and so that we don't miscommunicate. And let's look at a couple of examples here. So here we have a sentence, let's eat grandma and it, uh, let's eat grandma. <laughs> you know, it depends on how I pronounce that, right? And so that's what I'm going to get at here. And I apologize if some of you have seen this before in my class, but these sentences are, are designed to kind of make a point that depending on what you do with punctuation could really change the meaning of the sentence. So Imagine just for a minute, where would you put punctuation? Are you putting an exclamation mark? Are you putting a comma, a period, question mark? What are you putting here? So if you do the first one, let's eat grandma. There's just an exclamation. It, it's kind of like cannibalism, <laughs> which is not good, right? Uh, but if you put a comma after let's eat and then the exclamation point, it's like you're calling, let's eat grandma. You know, you're basically pausing there, right? And so again, seems very subtle and this is an extreme example but punctuation matters because it actually changes the meaning um, of the sentence and that would be something you don't want to miscommunicate grandma could get very nervous if she overheard that right um, okay here's another one i find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog these are three things now usually when we have three items in the series there's a comma rule that says we put a a comma after each one. So let's look at this one. How we, you can again, if you wanted to pause this and just sort of decide where would I put a comma, where would I put a period, would I put any punctuation, question mark, what would I do here? Um, and then possibly you had something like, I find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog, which sounds like you cook your family and your dog. I got several examples here of cannibalism. Sorry to start off that way. Um, I get your attention, I guess. I find inspiration in cooking, comma, my family, comma, and my dog, which means you know, I'm inspired by cooking. I'm also inspired by my family and I'm also inspired by my dog. I'm not cooking my dog. My dog is over here behind me, I think. See what, is he moving or anything? When I said I'm cooking my dog? No, maybe not. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, so this is, again, why punctuation is important. Sorry for the bad dad slash English teacher jokes. Um, I wanna thank my parents, Tiffany and God. So again, it sounds pretty normal. You're at a speech and you're thanking people who helped you and God who helped you. Uh, somebody who's, you know, giving credit to their higher power there. Um, but look how it looks depending on how you punctuate it. I want to thank my parents, Tiffany and God. This one sort of implies that your your parents, one parent is named Tiffany, the other parent is God. <laughs> so you're a, if anybody ever read the Percy Jackson books, um, which I read with my kids a few years back, um, that would be like, you know, the, uh, what are those called? The, um, now I can't remember, Percy Jackson's father was a god and his mother was a mortal right so he's a yeah they, they called them half bloods or something like that in those books but that was um that was what they're implying here so you want to make sure you put a comma after tiffany also this is sometimes called an oxford comma because i think it's almost like the implication is just kind of an elitist thing you don't need a comma there it's clear but again in some instances some cases if you don't put that extra comma after tiffany when you have these three things it, it, again, it makes a difference in meaning. Now we say, I want to thank my parents. I also want to thank Tiffany and I want to thank God. My parents are not Tiffany and God. They did not, you know, conceive me that way. All right. So um, my parents, comma, Tiffany, comma, and God. And that's where the Oxford comma, that second comma that comes in the items in a series can be useful. Okay. Here's a, here's a good one. Um, a woman without her man is nothing. So this one can really be changed depending on how you punctuate it. So if you wanted to pause it and just play around with the comma period just for a second and then come back and I'll show you the examples. So here we have a woman without her, a woman without her man is nothing. So that basically you have this woman here, she's kind of lonely and it's saying without a man, she's not complete, right? But over here, a woman, then we have what's called a colon, which we haven't talked about. And a colon is usually introducing uh, some more text. Sometimes it can be a list of things, um, but in this case, it's introducing another clause. And we say a woman without her, man is nothing. So in this case, the man is nothing without the woman. And in this case, the woman is nothing without the man. So it really changes by 
we put a colon and we put a comma after her. Uh, and you can see how, again, this changes the meaning. So punctuation can, can really make a difference. And it's um, not, again, something you have to worry about in the very beginning when you're writing a rough draft, but as you get to the end of a paper and you're revising it, it's a good time to think about, oh, is that comma, does that make sense? Uh, putting a colon there, does that make sense? So I have a question mark, uh, period, does that, does that communicate? Does the reader, could somebody understand what I'm trying to say? Oh, that's the last one. Wanted one night stand. Okay, so this one, depending on how we punctuate, you can pause this and play around with the punctuation a little bit and see what you come up with. And then we'll see in just a second if you want to pause and come back. So this one, wanted um, one night stand. And that's basically a piece of furniture that goes next to the bed, a nightstand, right? This one, when we change it, now this is what's called a hyphen. A hyphen is when we take two words and we stick them together, right, with a with a with uh, that piece of punctuation in between, one night. So this sounds like one night stand. In other words, a relationship that only lasts for one night. This one is a piece of furniture. So you can see it changes the meaning a lot um, from one night stand to one night stand. One night stand? I pronounced that wrong. Anyway, you get my meaning. So punctuation matters. That's why I keep emphasizing that. Uh, man eating chicken. This is almost the last one, I promise. Um, man eating chicken so here we have a man who's eating chicken then we have our hyphen again remember it becomes one word a man eating a chicken that's actually eating a man it's like a man eating tiger right we don't usually think of a chicken like that but again the hyphen changes the meaning quite a lot same thing here 25 dollars bills how much money is that well yeah, if you want to pause it and think about it 25 20 five dollar bills right so you have five dollar bills five dollar bills that's a five 20 of those, right? And that comes up to 100. $25 bills. So this one, we hyphenate the 25, and that means you have 25 singles, right? You have $25. This one's $100. So again, hyphens make a difference in meaning. I'm sorry, I love you, this one. Uh, and again, we have, I'm sorry, I love you, which is basically he's saying, I wish I didn't love you, or she's saying that. And um, I'm sorry, semicolon. Semicolon is where you can connect two complete ideas without using a period. And so we have basically two independent, what are called independent clauses, two independent sentences. I'm sorry, I love you. And it's basically an apology and then a reaffirmation, right? It's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I said that, but I love you, right? So this is a totally different meaning than with no semicolon. It's basically saying that the person regrets loving the other person, whereas this one, they're apologizing and then reaffirming that they love them. So 100% different uh, meaning just by one little punctuation mark. Security guard. Sometimes we put quotation marks around something and it, it's a joke, right? So here's the Chihuahua with the security guard mate. Well, I don't know, ch Chihuahuas could be pretty, pretty fierce, but a real security guard without quotation marks would just be an actual person who's a security guard. And then this one would be kind of like a joke, like you need know, the quotation marks around it. Yeah, eat your dinner or eat your dinner. This one, yeah, they're trying to get the cow fattened up or eat your dinner, yeah. So again, I think that's it. Now the peer response, I have to say, um, I'm having a little trouble with this. Uh, tomorrow's a holiday Monday, so I'm gonna try to fix this. If I can't fix this or however I fix it, I will let everybody know by Tuesday, which is like our official beginning to the week. So please, if you watch this video, look for an email or a message from me about the peer response. And if I don't get it fixed, we'll probably have to do it the old fashioned way, which is to email each other. But I, I'm trying to set it up in Blackboard so you'll automatically get um, somebody's paper sent to you. Uh, stay tuned for that if you can. Um, thanks for watching. This was a long video. I'm, if you stayed till the end, congratulations. <laughs> thanks for watching it. And again, as always, let me know if you have any questions uh, or any concerns, and I will let you know more about the peer response as this week goes on and hope to talk with you soon.